for our next speaker, we have our own Valerie Shalin, uh, and uh, she is a, a, a applied cognitive scientist by training. And I was surprised to know that she uh, was uh, coming from an industrial background, joined the engines industrial engineering department, and then now uh, she is currently with us as an adjunct faculty. And uh, I. Uh, uh, leave it to you uh, to begin your talk. So I'm not going to be presenting any fancy technology to you. I'm going to be talking about some of the work that I've done observing real physicians doing real work in their environment. And I am benefiting, of course, from input from my student, Claire Shaw, my former student, Eric Robinson, and my colleagues at the University of Maryland Shock Trauma. Um, I'm going to start with this quote that I like from my friend and colleague, Bill Clancy. People conceive of their everyday affairs, their practices, as social actors in activities in which they perceive, infer, move, manipulate objects, and communicate in some physical setting. For example, going to the grocery store to buy dinner. People act in a physical environment. But what we've done with technology is interpose representations between the human and their interaction in the physical environment. And that's a nice thing, representations, abstract. But the world is not the same thing as the things that are represented in your technology. And what our people are concerned about is the world and the effect of their behavior in the world. So I'm going to give you a couple of takeaway messages here from the work that I've done looking at physicians uh, dealing with patients. Um, we need to think about uh, technology knowing more about its context of use. And I want to talk about two dimensions. I'll mention two of them. It's cultural context of use and it's physical context of use. And I want us to stop obsessing over, is there a problem? Are you worried? <laughs> Thank you. I want us to stop obsessing over medical error as the sole purpose of the technology. I'm not saying we should build unsafe systems, but I am saying that a far broader, more critical concern is to worry about expanding access. And that in order to expand access, we're going to have to consider cultural context and physical context in the technology that we develop. So let me tell you why I'm so worried about this first. Uh, at least in the United States, we have a general physician shortage. We have a growing population. We have an aging demographic. Uh, we have a broadband now that enables telework. And what we're seeing is a migration from urban centers to suburban and even rural um, areas, less populated areas. At the same time, we have a big uh, uh, social and sociocultural concern. Um, advances in science and technology are promoting the division of cognitive labor. So if you go and look at the Association of American Medical Colleges, you will see that there are 135 specialties and subspecialties in American medicine. And so you take this same population of physicians and you divide them over these different specialties and you're going to get sort of very narrow uh, availability. So uh, just for fun, I looked at the trauma care centers in, in South Carolina because we'll be talking about trauma uh, today. And um, what you see here uh, is the level one trauma care centers. They're in blue, green, and purple, and they provide the most comprehensive and advanced care in trauma. Level two uh, initiate, initiates definitive care. And level three just stabilizes you until you can get somewhere that you need to be. So if you happen to live here and you have a trauma problem, you're in trouble because you're about two hours away from somebody who can take care of you properly. So let's consider a little made up story here. We have Reggie who uh, injured his calf muscles while cleaning out an old barn in Williston, South Carolina. That's pretty much where that little arrow was. Uh, the pain persists after, after icing. And he, after an hour or so, Reggie heads to the nearest hospital, which is about two hours away. Uh, it's a level two center that has recently recruited a new set of young uh, emergency department specialists and general surgeons uh, in response to a growing population. 
but the doctors here are going to be inexperienced. The injury that Reggie experienced is unusual due to advances in automobile safety, so we don't have a lot of this particular type of injury anymore. Timely treatment is essential to avoid uh, further damage, and the surgical repair is unfamiliar and error prone. So I want to tell you a little bit about what goes on in an emergency department and emphasize the context sensitivity of what the doctors are doing. And then I'll move on to the surgical uh, intervention problem. We've observed more than 300 patients managed by more than 35 different physicians. About half of them were expert attending physicians and half of them were residents. And their goal, in contrast to what most of cognitive psychology thinks about as the goal in medicine, their goal is not to diagnose, but rather to stabilize and distribute patients for further care. We looked at both suburban and urban hospitals. Uh, the suburban hospital used paper uh, triage sheets, and the urban hospital used electronic medical record systems and nurses who tended to order triage labs. And one of the most important things that we found is that the novice residents are far less efficient in interacting with patients, even though they had the benefit of electronic records. And in fact, uh, electronic medical records can even impede coordinated distributed work. So here on the right-hand side, uh, you'll see the resident, the less well-trained, and I don't expect you to read this dialogue, but you know his interactions with the patient. And then on the left-hand side, uh, you see the far more experienced attending physician who happened to be working in the suburban hospital. Now, why, why would it be the case that you know, electronic medical records, which you know, have, are supposed to have some benefits, um, how could that actually impede distributed work? Well, for one thing, when you have paper uh, charts dis displayed on a display rack, as you incidentally walk by that display rack, you can get a good sense of what the workload is in that particular unit. When you see a paper chart on somebody's desk, you know that that chart is assigned to that particular uh, physician. Again, without inquiring specifically through technology, you get this information in passing. So our analyses focused on whether or not the, uh, there was a difference between the attending experienced physicians and the less experienced resident uh, physicians on these aspects of context. And we have enough data to actually do a statistical analysis demonstrating that our uh, experienced physicians are far more sensitive to the difficulty that a patient provides, the difficulty of the current shift and the workload that's going on, and the capabilities of the hospital. And these two um, excerpts that I've provided here are actually for the same kind of case that has to do uh, with a heart problem. So if we want to increase efficiency, which I believe increases access, our technology needs to be much more sensitive to the context of use, identifying that a patient is particularly difficult and not necessarily difficult in a medical sense, uh, but difficult in other respects. Uh, for example, having a spouse or family member that is complicating the interaction with the patient, shift difficulty and hospital capabilities. So let's move on now to the uh, surgical um, extension of this problem. Our, our patient Reggie here needs something called a fasciotomy. And a fasciotomy is uh, performed in order to address something called compartment syndrome. When you crush the leg muscles, the muscles swell and the muscles are contained by fascia and the pressure builds up and causes lots of problems. And the way to handle this is to um, slice through the fascia that are surrounding the multiple uh, muscle compartments. The muscle compartments are um, sort of hidden. Uh, it's easy to miss them. And so we've developed with my colleagues at Maryland Shock Trauma, a tool to help people 
uh, work through this rather unfamiliar surgery. Uh, the tool is called the Surgical Technical Assistance Tool, and I'll abbreviate he this here as STAT. It's not fancy in terms of the uh, collaborative technology that you guys are interested in. It just provides a canned procedure guide identifying steps along with a short 80 to 20 second video clip. Uh, and the surgeon can uh, uses a touch panel to interact with these various steps of the surgery. Sorry, I should have given you a warning. It's a tad gory. I've done this surgery myself though, so I can, I can speak to exactly what it's like. It's difficult. Uh, and by the way, that one was for the upper fasciotomy. We're worried about a lower fasciotomy, but that doesn't make a big difference for the examples that I want to make. Now we, we um, compared the uh, novice surgeons interacting with the STAT tool to a telementor who was seated, seated in a remote location, monitoring what the surgeon was doing and uh, providing real-time advice to the surgeon. And these are the results. Um, in general, yes, our tool did help the inexperienced surgeon manage a difficult surgery like this, uh, but the telementor still did better. The telementor was still improving performance uh, in a way that the uh, tool was not. And so my team is charged with understanding exactly what is going on in that telementoring interaction to facilitate performance. Um, so um, one of the things we know is that the telementor's word count increased um, as the surgeon's surgical procedure score uh, decreased. Now, we don't think this is causal. We don't think the telementor was actually making things worse. Uh, we think that what was going on is that the telementor was adapting to the limitations of the surgeon and trying to, uh, to provide some compensatory advice. Uh, and we did a number of analyses on the uh, dialogues that we got from the telementor and the, and the surgeon. And we ruled out a bunch of likely interventions like general feedback and encouragement and things like that. Uh, we found out that the Luke category in jest <laughs> seemed to be related to the telementor's interventions. And we looked at that in jest category and we thought, what the heck could be in there? This certainly isn't about eating. Uh, and we identified fat management as the focus of the dialogue. So the point here is that there is a specific reference between the telementor and the physician regarding a feature of the physical context, which was not available to the technology. And we just pulled out uh, here a, a transcript for you to see the discussion about fat um, in the um, interactions. And then uh, in parallel, uh, we didn't know this, we all did a kind of a vector analysis of the um, dialogue content and compared the dialogues uh, between the different um, physicians. And we found that one physician really stood out, this guy 422, and we went back and looked at his case and it turned out that he was dealing with a rather corpulent cadaver. So the takeaway messages. Um, the very simple technologies that I talked about today, electronic medical records and triage sheets, et cetera, um, they don't know about their context of use. The STAT system doesn't know about its context of use. There's a cultural context that we need to consider. Expert emergency department physicians adapt to patient difficulty, shift difficulty, and hospital variables. Uh, and certainly, you know, electronic medical records technology doesn't address that kind of expertise and, and that kind of context sensitivity. And then I also talked about the physical context, um, anatomical variants in, in, in a surgical setting really interact or, or really influence um, the difficulty that a surgeon is having and need to impact the advice that we give him 
or her. I said we should stop obsessing over medical error. I don't mean that we need unsafe systems, <laughs> but I do worry about expanding access because if we aren't expanding access, we're leaving a whole bunch of people completely untreated and that itself is at least an ethical and moral error. Uh, and I suggested that we need to develop technology that enables shared context to enhance efficiency. And there's some references here. We've been doing this about almost 15 years working in the medical uh, world. And with that, I'm very happy to take some questions. Yeah, actually, I was wondering when you were comparing the three cases, right? If you could elaborate the teleprompter uh, example a little bit more. Uh, yes. Uh, so, like, the stat he, versus tips that was. Yeah, this is the, the stat tool is, um, it's just a, a really canned procedure guide. It shows photos um, for each step. There's actually sometimes videos. So if you, you know, if, if you need to uh, mark an incision, it shows you how to mark the incision and the landmarks and then uh, making the incision. And then the doer asks, give, give me the next step. Give me the next step. Or yeah. System sees and then yeah, it can, it can do that. Um, and, and, and we also allowed for you to go back in case you wanted to go back and review something because in this uh, kind of a situation, one of the common errors is to have not made your incision correctly. So you are uh, operating in a hole, we say. And so it's very conceivable that a surgeon would wanna go back and see where those landmarks really should have been for making the uh, appropriate incision. Was, I think uh, the third two, right? The tips. Yeah. So there is uh, someone who is. Doing it's a person. Work. Yep. It's a person. So could it be the case that the person who's watching remotely gives them very contextual kind of feedback? Yes, you can do this, you can do this. Uh, well, we looked at, you know, so it's actually kind of embarrassing <laughs> how many different things we looked at. We, we actually looked at six thousand <laughs> correlations between what the physician was doing and the results of the, or what the telementor was doing and the results of the surgeon. And, and this was the thing, this ingest category, this was the thing that was the most consistent across all of our um, surgeries and all of our examples. So, you know, we, we did rule out, we were thinking, you know, um, feedback, encouragement, um, you know, error correction. We looked all down those pathways um, and really didn't find anything systematic that would account for, you know, what it was the telementor was, was actually doing and how he was being responsive in this situation. Okay. Any other, questions? Other, other questions? This is um Denise Davis. I'm on I'm on the chat with y'all. I just let me see if uh -huh. I can start my video. I, I just had a question for you because it was it does sound like what you're saying is that the tele uh, mentor had better success and other than trying to find a scientific reason for it, it was just possibly their presence. That it was a uh, is there a social it, it could, is there a social aspect that is better it, off? It could be a so, it could be a social aspect. Um, you know that wasn't something that we were analyzing in the dialogue specifically, except for you know this encouragement, uh, you know feedback function, which might. Right. There was um, <laughs> uh, uh, in one of the surgeries. Um, there was an indication that as the surgeon was failing, our telementor was becoming increasingly anxious. Um, I wouldn't think of that as an actually a positive benefit of, of the telementor, um, but that is something that we could look at. Um, we do have um, some control conditions, which we haven't looked at here. So I've just analyzed in what I presented for you here, um, the interactions between the telementor and the surgeon. We do have think aloud protocols with STAT 
and I have think aloud protocols in the control condition. And so that might be uh, one way we could tease out the effect of just the, the social presence of the telementor.